Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen. I'm the executive director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Thank you for joining us this evening to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We're very grateful to welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Dion Alfamato from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, who will be discussing the significance of the Avion Conference's 85th anniversary. We also have the support of several elected officials and senior administrators here at Queensborough Community College and CUNY. And so it's my great honor to begin this evening's program by introducing the president of Queensborough Community College, Dr. Christine Mangino. Good evening. My name is Dr. Christine Mangino, president of Queensborough Community College. In a few days, on January 27th, the world marks the 79th anniversary of the liberation of one of the most notorious extermination and concentration camps during the Holocaust, Auschwitz-Birkenau, where the Nazis murdered approximately 1.1 million people, the vast majority of whom were Jewish. On this International Holocaust Remembrance Day, the world is once again seeing a terrifying rise in anti-Jewish sentiments and anti-Semitic incidences in response to the fallout of the October 7th terrorist attack in Israel and its subsequent war with Hamas. I assure you that Queensborough Community College is committed to combating anti-Semitism, racism, and all other forms of discrimination and hate on our campus. Each day, we work to foster a safe and welcoming atmosphere for all our students, faculty, and staff. Our commitment to cultivating a community of care and respect includes supporting the important work of Queensborough's Kupferberg Holocaust Center, the only 9,000 square foot space devoted to Holocaust education in the City University of New York. Through its public programs, annual commemorations, exhibits, and collaborations with QCC faculty and speakers from around the country, the KHC fulfills its mission of making Holocaust education accessible to everyone. I am looking forward to hearing from and learning from Dr. Dion Afumadu, Chief of the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. On behalf of Dr. Cohen, the staff of the Kupferberg Center, and all the wonderful people who support our work, as well as Queensboro faculty, staff, and students, thank you and welcome. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Felix Matos Rodriguez, the Chancellor of the City University of New York. Thank you, Dr. Mangino, and thank you, Dr. Cohen. Good evening and thanks to everyone for joining us in marking International Holocaust Remembers Day here at the City University of New York. I want to extend my deep thanks to the Kufferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College, which not only organizes this commemoration each year, but does as much as any organization in New York City to keep the history of the Holocaust alive and to educate new generations at a time when it is so vital. Thank you also to the many partners and co-sponsors of this evening's program and to our guest, Dr. Dayon Afumadu, the Chief of the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. A warm CUNY welcome to all of you. These annual observance represent our shared commitment to remembering a dark chapter of history that is sadly all too relevant to the times we live in today. Every year, it seems, brings new incidents of anti-Semitism that require us not only to remember history, but to give meaning to that memory. Two years ago, Holocaust Remembers Day came just 12 days after a government took a rabbi and three congregants hostage in a synagogue in Texas. Last year, it came after a year in which crimes targeting Jewish New Yorkers more than doubled. This year, we're reeling from the aftershocks of the October 7th attacks and the new wave of global anti-Semitism that has followed. As educators and historians, 
we must lead the way in actively confronting hate in all its forms. College campuses are not immune from the ills that affect the rest of society, nor from the ignorance, misinformation, and Holocaust denial that helps feed anti-Semitism. Numerous surveys have demonstrated that young people today have a worrisome lack of knowledge about the Holocaust, and that a lot of what they learn comes from the internet where Holocaust distortion and anti-Semitism are rife. History shows, again and again, that education is the best tool to combat anti-Semitism. That is why CUNY, as New York City's public university system, has the critical responsibility to support Holocaust education. And why it is important as part of our multifaceted effort to address anti-Semitism and more broadly to increase understanding and respect between diverse religious, ethnic, and cultural groups on our campuses. Over the past year, our efforts have included helping our campuses increase their vigilance against all form of bias and hate, partnering with Hillel's International Campus Climate Initiative, and making it easier for members of our community to report incidents of hate speech, violent discrimination, and retaliation. We have committed over $1.3 million to support a wide range of anti-hate programs across our 25 campuses. We also combat anti-Semitism in ways that are symbolic but still meaningful, like joining the Stand Up to Jewish Hate campaign as we did last May. In ways that might not always be obvious, these and all efforts to confront anti-Semitism are acts of Holocaust remembrance. Heartfelt thanks again to the Kofferberg Holocaust Center, to its partners, and to all of you who are doing your part to keep memory alive to educate the next generation and to stand against the ugliness of bigotry and hate that has long outlived the Holocaust. Hi, I'm Queensborough President Donovan Richards, and welcome to today's virtual International Holocaust Remembrance Day event hosted by the Comfortburg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College. Today we come together to mourn the six million Jews and millions of others who were viciously murdered by the Nazi regime and its allies. We hold this commemoration on the anniversary of Auschwitz liberation in 1945, because only once Auschwitz was liberated did the immense scope of the Holocaust become clear. And that horror is why the world collectively pledges every year to never let it happen again. But let's be clear, anti-Semitism didn't start with the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism didn't end with the Holocaust either. Rampant, unchecked anti-Semitism is what allowed the Holocaust to take place. And as time passes, our world's commitment to the Pledge of Never Again is being challenged yet again. We will soon reach the point where there will be no one on Earth who was alive when the Holocaust took place, no one to remember the true horror of that time. That begs the question of what we can do today to make sure that sort of evil cannot happen tomorrow. The Comfort World Holocaust Center has long been trying to find answers to this question. And as part of its continuing mission, the center has convened tonight's conversation about the world's failure to aid German and Austrian Jewish refugees trying to flee Nazi persecution before World War II. It is a critically important conversation, and it's one that couldn't be more relevant today. Not only is anti-Semitism on the rise, but as a recent influx of asylum seekers has shown, there are many people out there who demonize refugees for no reason other than their ethnicity or race. But if we learn anything from the Holocaust, it's that we all share one common humanity, that we all have an obligation to each other, that we have a duty to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive so we never forget what can happen when hate is allowed to fester. So I thank the Comfortbrook Holocaust Center for convening tonight's commemoration. I'm proud Queens is home to such a worldwide leader in the study of the Holocaust and its legacy. And I hope tonight's event leads to further discussions in our understanding of the Holocaust and how it remains relevant to us today. It is events like these that bring us closer to a world free of all forms of hate and violence. Thank you so much for having me this evening. When we say never again, 
we mean never again. May peace be with each and every one of you. Thank you. Today on Holocaust Remembrance Day, I am grateful to join the leadership of the City University of New York and Queensborough Community College at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center to remember, reflect, and stand in solidarity with the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. Today, we remember innocent lives systematically killed in one of the most horrific murder campaigns in human history. In remembrance of their lives, we vow never again. Our call to action must meet the unique challenges of our time. We find ourselves in an era where those who would deny and distort the history of the Holocaust are finding insidious new ways to spread their lies and disinformation. And so the work ahead of us is urgent. We must recommit ourselves to supporting Holocaust educational awareness efforts, as well as vanquishing anti-Semitism and all forms of racism, religious hatred, homophobia, or xenophobia. And it's why I'm committed as district attorney to protect the vision and the inclusivity of our Jewish communities. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our Jewish neighbors have faced increased threats of violence, harassment, vandalism, and assault. According to the NYPD data, there's been a steep rise in hate crimes against Jewish New Yorkers over the last two years. From drawing swastikas on local synagogues to vandalizing public parks and memorials, the rise of anti-Semitism is unacceptable and we must eradicate it from our borough. Each attack is a stain on the moral fiber of all communities and each of us must stand up, stop the spread of hate. In recognition of these alarming and dangerous trends, I established the borough's first dedicated hate crimes bureau within six months of taking this office, one of the first in the nation committed exclusively to preventing, investigating, and prosecuting hate crimes targeted against any and all groups. Every person, no matter their race, background, religion, or language, is created equal and deserves to be treated as such throughout their entire lives. That's the very idea of America, and it remains at the heart of my administration. Here in Queens, we are 190 countries and 200 languages. Our vast array of traditions, perspectives, and backgrounds, our melting pot, is what makes us unique. It's what keeps us dynamic and entrepreneurial. It's what makes Queens home. And so when there is an incident against a Jewish victim or any victim, even if it's not deemed a hate crime by definition of the law, we still prosecute and we do it aggressively. If we cannot legally establish that the perpetrator acted based on that bias, we prosecute based on the underlying crime. There will be consequences for hateful acts. So as we pause today in memory of our victims and survivors of the Holocaust, let us remember the precious lives and memories that teach us why it is important not only to remember but also to act. Let us act with courage that outshines hate. Let us act towards a vision of safety, kindness, and inclusivity for all of our neighbors everywhere. And let these actions be a legacy that is worthy of the memories of our lost loved ones. Zikranon Labraha. Thank you very much. We're very grateful for all the support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Michowski, Instruction Reference Librarian and Associate Professor at New York City College of Technology, who co-convened this evening's event with us. Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Uh, yes, my name is Keith Michowski, and I'm a librarian and professor at New York City College of Technology. And this talk is a collaboration between City Tech's Ursula C. Schwerin Library and Queensborough Community College's Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center in support of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's recent traveling exhibition, Americans in the Holocaust, which examines how Americans reacted to Nazism, war, refugees, and genocide before and during the Second World War. City Tech's library was one of 50 libraries selected to host the exhibition which was on display at City Tech this past fall. And one can still see the full installation at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. 
I would like to thank Dr. Laura Cohen, Executive Director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, and Marissa Hollywood, the Kupferberg Center's Associate Director. And I would like to also thank Professor Monica Berger from the Ursula C. Schwerin Library. And of course, I'd like to thank the American Library Association and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum itself. This, this event is co-sponsored by the Ray Walpo Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and the Holocaust Museum and Center for Tolerance and Education at Rockland Community College. The Avion Conference was 85 years ago this past summer, and its consequences played out in the ensuing years and decades. From July 6th to 15th, 1938, representatives from 32 nations met in the French spa town of Avion Laban to discuss the plight of Germany's Jewish refugees. While largely in agreement that the situation for German and European Jewry was dire, most representatives then argued that there was little that their individual nations could do at the present time. The speaker for, tonight, for tonight's event, the Avion Conference and the Refugee Crisis 85 years later, is Dr. Dion F. Afamato. Dr. Afamato is chief of the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. She is the author of several books and has written more than 20 articles related to the Holocaust. So Dr. Afamato, I turn it over to you. Good evening. Um, thank you. Thank you, Keith. And um, thank you all very much for inviting me um, and for rescheduling this event to give me the opportunity to speak about the Evian Conference and the refugee crisis in 1938. I would like to thank particularly Laura, Keith, and Marisa Hollywood for uh, their interest and for their warm welcome. Before jumping into the uh, central topic, please allow me to briefly lay out some of the uh, some basic facts and information regarding the general context. So when the uh, Nazis took power in 1933, they quickly targeted and excluded the Jews from German society by enacting discriminatory laws and organizing violence and Anti-Semitic propaganda supported Nazi policy by depicting the Jews as foreign elements that needed to be cut off from German society. On that slide, a photograph from 1935 shows a young man on a motorcycle gazing up at a sign posted on a telephone pole that reads, quote, Jews are not welcome here, unquote. I think that is, it's, it is important to remember that in the 1930s, the Jewish population was approximately 500,000 people, about 1% of the German population. The Nazi expansion policy in Europe was always accompanied by anti-Semitic measures. When Austria was annexed to the Reich in March 1938, laws and other measures similar to those in Germany were quickly implemented. The photograph that you are looking at is dated 1938. Viennese pedestrians view a large Nazi sign posted on a restaurant window informing the public that this business is run by an organization of the National Socialist Party and that Jews are not welcome. We know what happened during the Holocaust, but it is important to bear in mind that people had to make choices based on the information they had at the time of the events. Therefore, chronology is crucial when talking about the Evian Conference. In 1938, three major events changed the situation of the Jews from the worse. In March, the Anschluss added approximately 200,000 to the Jewish population of the Reich. In July, the Evian Conference was called by President Roosevelt. And in November, Kristallnacht, considered as the first pogrom of the 20th century in Germany, took place. Thus, as the Avion Conference got on the way, the Jews in Germany had already experienced persecutions since 1933, 
but had not yet faced the equivalent of a pogrom. Many were still trying to survive, hoping that things would settle down. More than half of the Jews who managed to flee the Reich did, not, did so in the late 1938 and 1939, even though finding a place to go was becoming an ever greater challenge. Remember that in the late 1930s, the two remaining options that the Jews had to find refuge, refuge were Shanghai, then under, under Japanese occupation, and Cuba. As you can imagine, they were not exactly the first choices of the Jews from Germany and Austria. The refugee crisis of the 1930s was not the first one of the 20th century. But Evian was an attempt to answer a crisis that differed from that which followed World War I and motivated the establishment of the creation of the League of Nations in 1920 and the High Commissioner for Refugees in 1921. The collapse of the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires and their replacement by new nation states following World War I displaced millions. Between 1922 and 1926, Russians, Assyro-Chaldeans, Armenians received what became known as Nansen passports that could be defined as a certificate that the Nansen International Office for Refugees issued as a substitute for a passport for stateless people. During the League of Nations um, period, several institutions, none of which had much authority, um, were created to confront multiple refugee crises. In 1933, the League of Nations established the first embryo of the legal status of refugees before organizing two intergovernmental conferences in 1936 and 1938 to discuss the status of refugees, primarily Jewish, from Germany. According to the High Commissioner for Refugees, 329,000 Jews left the German Reich between 1933 and 1939 despite increasing challenges. Several countries in Europe had already accepted thousands, mostly those that had borders with Germany. But a few months before the Evian Conference, most of those countries found ways to restrict immigration. This trend coincided with the appearance or the revival of a number of improbable schemes for Jewish immigration, such as Madagascar, Baja California, the Dominican Republic, and even Alaska. The world seemed to be divided into two groups, countries where Jews could no longer live and those where they could not go. Most of the countries that would participate in the Evian Conference already had restricted immigration, immigration laws. Some like the United States, Brazil, and Mexico had quotas. Others restricted immigration to certain nationalities or groups, Honduras, Bolivia, Paraguay, Panama, Nicaragua. Other South American countries conditioned immigration to certain skills. Some countries also reinforced their restrictions on the eve of Evian. Brazil, Denmark, for example, or Holland, which tightened restrictions on immigration to its colony in Suriname. Others reinforced their laws right after the conference, such as Argentina. President Roosevelt wanted to increase American quotas, but that would have required Congress approval. He also had to deal with public opinion. A majority of Americans believed that German Jews were either entirely or partly to blame for their own persecution and were not in favor of letting more refugees in at a time when unemployment stood at um, 19%. This slide is from the website that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum created to support the exhibition about Americans and the Holocaust that Keith mentioned earlier. I encourage you to visit the exhibition if you can and view the website that contains a lot of information, photographs, film footage, statistics, and much more. A few words about the general context. The Evian Conference took place in France, though at the initiative of the United, States, the United States. But while the world was closing its doors to the Jewish refugees, 
most people continued to focus on their own problems. During crises, people turned to ways to escape. In the US, 80 million Americans went to the movies every week where they saw comedies such as Bringing Up Baby and adventurous stories such as Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. Children enjoyed Mickey Mouse while Disney Studios was working on what would become Fantasia. Many Americans felt the need for superheroes to save the world. Superman appeared in the magazine Action Comics a month before the Asian Conference. In France, the heroes did not have superpowers, and some were created by Bel Belgian artists. The little bellboy named Spirou was strictly entertainment, but the reporter Tintin appeared in a satire of German expansionism based on the Anschluss. Meanwhile, a cartoon published by the New York Times on July 3, 1938, summarizes the situation of Jews trying to leave the Reich. In an intersection shaped like a swastika, a man wearing a, a kippah and labeled as non-Aryan sits before a sign telling him to go. But at each end of the swastika, you can see the world stop as the Evian Conference shines in the background as the only hope this man has left. Let's talk now about the organization of the conference. In 1938, organizations such as the League of Nations and the Nansen Office were totally under-equipped to respond to the situation. In no position to change America's quotas policy, Roosevelt chose another option, convening a conference of countries potentially able to accept refugees. Sadly, Roosevelt could not expect much when he himself could not show an example. Countries hoping to take advantage of the conference to push their own Jews to leave were not invited, Romania, Hungary, and Poland, and others. Roosevelt used the term political refugees to avoid mentioning the Jews, but no one was fooled. Indeed, France was the second choice for the conference because Switzerland wanted nothing to do with it. Switzerland did not, did not want the possibility for an intergovernmental committee to permanently stay in the country. But above all, it did not want to damage its good relationship with Germany. It was a real tour de force to organize such a conference in July in one of, the, of France's busiest resorts in less than four months. Visitors desiring to take the waters usually booked a year in advance. Despite the coolness in relations between America and the League of Nations, the latter was in charge of the technical aspects of the conference and gathered the necessary staff, such as secretaries, interpreters, and others. Just a reminder that the United States never joined the League of Nations. The budget of the conference was largely covered by the United States, but participating countries had to pay their own expenses. This book that you see on the slide is the registry book of the Hotel Royal that contains the list of the participants from the 32 countries that attended the conference. Just one anecdote here that I'd like to share with you. I found in the archives an exchange of correspondence between Myron Taylor, the American representative, and the Grand Hotel about the choice of rooms. He eventually chose a room with a view at the Hotel Royal not that he would spend a lot of time admiring the landscape during the conference. Roosevelt hoped that some South American countries, especially the ones that had enough space, such as Argentina and Brazil, would agree to accept a meaningful number of refugees. But his representative, Myron Taylor's expectations, sounded much more realistic. In a letter to the French representative, Taylor wrote, quote, we must admit that the problem of political refugees is so vast that we won't be able to do much more during this conference than studying the mechanism that on the long term will help those unfortunate human beings that we need to take care of, unquote. There was a yet little sense of emergency. The conference took place between July 6 and 15 of 1938. There are not many photos of the conference because the debates and discussions were not public. On this slide, you see the American delegate Myron Taylor standing. 
journalists and Jewish organizations were excluded from the sessions. 39 delegations among them, 21 representing Jewish organizations, sent delegates to the conference. A certain Golda Meir son, better known as Golda Meir, the future prime minister of the state of Israel between 1969 and 1974, represented the Yishuv, the body of Jewish resident in Palestine prior to the creation of the state of Israel. Those Jewish representatives had only a few minutes to present their plans, but most of them submitted written proposals. The main problem of those organizations was that they could not agree among themselves about what to do. Some submitted proposals that were, to say the least, impractical. Palestine might have been a practical option, but the British would not hear of it. The official language at Avion were uh, official languages at Avion were English and French. On this slide, you can see Myron Taylor, the U.S. representative, James McDonald, member of the U.S. delegation and chair of the President's Advisory Committee on Political Refugees from 1938 to 1945, the British Zionist leader Norman Bentwich, in conversation with Henri Béranger, the French representative. Most of the delegates acknowledged the situation and some even went so far as to express empathy for the refugees. But despite such diplomatic language, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, Uruguay, Nicaragua, and Haiti suddenly needed only farmers and foresters. Even immigrant Argentina required only farmers. Suddenly, it seemed that the whole world needed farmers only. Admittedly, anti-Semitism was not the only motivation. During the Great Depression, neither workers nor businessmen wanted new competition. Another important point that the conference reveals is that there is no correlation between dictatorship countries and immigration restriction. However, a less ambiguous statement came from Australia, whose representative said his country did not have a racial problem and did not want to import one. It was certainly a terrible thing to say and to hear, but it surely reflected what a lot of representatives were thinking but not saying. The well-known offer from the Dominican Republic to welcome 10,000 Jewish refugees seemed very generous compared to the Australian um, statement. But this was not because President Trujillo was sympathetic to the Jews. His main motivation was to attract more white immigrants. In addition to this demographic purpose, Trujillo also conditioned his offer of, to the, uh, on the deposit of $500 per Jewish refugee. A third consideration was making a humanitarian gesture following Dominica's ostracism from the international community after its massacre of 20,000 Haitians at the border in October 19, 1937. In a telegram sent to the State Department, Myron Taylor reported that several South American countries, among them Colombia, Venezuela, Uruguay, and Chile, had asked him to help them evade any obligation to accept refugees because they did not want to jeopardize their relationship with Germany. In such a situation, no concrete solution emerged from the conference, unless one considers the creation of the Intergovernmental Committee headquartered in London to continue the discussion. Despite the obvious reticence, some countries accepted various numbers of Jewish refugees following uh, the following years, during the following years. Statistics are very difficult to gather and vary based on definitions. About 125,000 Germans, most of them Jewish, immigrated to the U.S. between 1933 and 1945. Brazil issued 10,000 visas to Jewish refugees between 1939 and 1942. Bolivia, which had the very, a strict immigration policy and did not want to accept Chinese and Jews, ended up accepting about 20,000 Jews from Europe between 1938 and 1941. Such examples show that Avion might not have been the best way to approach the Jewish refugee crisis. More discreet negotiations might have produced better results 
because most countries represented at the conference fear that any demonstration of generosity and humanity might have invited a flood of refugees. Nevertheless, anti-Semitism, economic depression, and the fear of antagonizing Germany were important reasons for Avion's failure. For people today, the Avion Conference represents the disappointing official response of some potential countries of refuge of, to the Jews in the Reich. But what did it represent for the Jews trying to leave Germany and Austria? What did they know about the debates over their fate? What did, what did the newspapers publish? The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum initiated the History Unfolded project a few years ago in partnership with schools across the country to capture newspaper articles about various topics related to, related to the Holocaust. Here is the first page of this project on our website related to articles published in American newspapers about the Evgen Conference. I don't really have time to give you a detailed analysis of the content of all the newspapers in various countries. I will limit myself to the press in Germany and, and the United States. And this is a very, very brief overview. In Germany, newspapers published information almost daily about the conference. The content of the articles went from irony about the fact that there was no need for Jewish intellectuals in South America, as the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung put it on July 11th, to anti-Semitic statements of the Nazi party official organ, the Volkischer Beobachter, which used Avion to distill anti-Jewish propaganda that targeted New York as, quote, the largest Jewish city in the world, unquote. Most German newspapers rejoiced to see that Avion did not propose any solution for the Jewish refugees. They also highlighted the fact that Despite criticize, criticizing Germany uh, or German policy against the Jews, no country was willing to accept them. On July 13, 1938, three days before the end of the conference, the Volkischer Beobachter wrote, quote, nobody wants them, unquote. Nazi Germany was, of course, not invited to the Avion conference, but it rejoiced at the failure of Avion to come to any solutions. Evian was clearly perceived in the Reich as a sort of carte blanche to continue with their anti-Semitic policy. In the United States, the subject attracted considerable um, attention from the moment Roosevelt launched the initiative. Most newspapers across the country published at least something about Evian. The New York Times mentioned the Jewish refugees almost daily. Some newspapers referred to the fact that America had traditionally been a country that afforded asylum to persecuted people, but they also mentioned that the immigration law of 1924 had made this conditional. Once the conference started, many limited coverage um, to whatever Associated Press was reporting, limited their coverage to whatever the Associated Press uh, was reporting. That said, just because most newspapers around the world published something about the conference doesn't mean that everyone knew about it. Certainly not the Jews who were desperately looking for a place to go. In most of the museum's relevant oral, hit, oral um, testimonies by survivors, Evian doesn't seem to figure heavily. Most of them mention that they or their parents might have heard of it, but others clearly stated that they probably had not. Jews in the Reich trying to leave were um, focusing on gathering the necessary documents and on finding a country to go to. Evian was too high level for them. Evian is often presented as a failure. From Roosevelt's perspective, it was, because of the hope he had placed in particular in the South American countries, turned out to have been misplaced. Indeed, Evian was worse than a failure. A failure implies an attempt. Most of those countries that attended did so with no intention of proposing any solution. For the Jews, the conference had been completely fruitless, having brought to short -term, no short-term amelioration to the problem. Admittedly, the conference created a new intergovernmental committee on refugees to continue the discussion. However, it received almost no funding and enjoyed very little authority. Evian was the official response to the Jews 
who were trying to find refuge. It was also a green light to the Nazis that there would be no consequences for continued persecutions of the Jews. After Evian, other countries had very little moral standing to criticize how the Nazis were treating the Jews since they themselves did not want to give them asylum. If there was little of an emergency in July 1938, less than four months later, things took a sharp turn for the worse. After almost the entire world had closed its doors to the Jewish refugees, on November 9th and 10th, Nazi party officials set off a series of violent pogroms in Germany and Austria that became known as the Kristallnacht. On the slide you are looking at, Germans pass by the broken shop window of a Jewish-owned business that was ransacked on November 10th. The Nazi regime ordered the, pol the police to arrest about 30,000 German Jewish men, innocent victims, who had, no, who had committed no crime. These were sent to concentration camps, such as Dachau and Buchenwald. The document that you're seeing comes from the International Tracing Service Digital Archive, of which the museum is the United States National Repository. It is the official arrest record for a man named Kurt Steinhardt, taken into custody in what was officially called the Judenaktion on the second night of Kristallnacht, and that he had been sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp. Despite making front page news around the world, that pogrom did not change public opinion towards Jewish refugees. In the United States, 94% of people who participated in one poll stated that they disapproved of the, of the treatment of the Jews in Nazi Germany. But when asked, quote, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States, unquote, 71% were opposed. 85 years after the conference, what is left? You saw some of the rare photographs that were taken during the conference, the registration book. Tens of thousands of archival documents exist about Evian, including the minutes. But the Evian conference did not leave much traces in people's memory, especially on the other side of the Atlantic. The Hotel Royal still welcomes many visitors during the summer for the same reasons as in 1938. But would a visitor today have any way of knowing what it was uh, and that it, that it was a site of an important discussion about the fate of the Jews on the eve of the Holocaust? In France, the Evian Conference is not particularly commemorated. And when Evian is mentioned in a historical context, it mostly refers to the Avion Accords of 1962 related to the war in Algeria. Thank you very much for your attention and I would be happy to take questions and comments. Dr. Afamato, thank you very much for that. And uh, before we get to questions, I just had uh, one quick comment. And uh, you mentioned in your talk, History Unfolded, the project that the Holocaust Museum um, has been, uh, has been uh, doing for several years now. And um, that project has actually been incorporated into the Americans in the Holocaust traveling exhibit, as I'm sure you know. And um, when people were at the college looking at the exhibit um, this past fall, um, people were reading those newspaper articles on the tablets that were provided as part of the installation. And um, people often spoke uh, quite movingly about um, Giving those uh, newspaper accounts from from that from that time period, but just thought I would um, mention that. And um, there are a few questions here, and uh, one of them um, came in, and then you answered a little bit of it uh, a little bit uh, after the question came in. But um, a person asks uh, the Avian Conference preceded Kristallnacht by um, by a few months. Had it been the other way around, do you think that there would have been more of a multinational welcoming response to Jewish refugees? And you kind of um, spoke about the American response, but but maybe you could put it into an international context a little bit also, if you would. Well, it is hard to write history on the conditional tense. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to imagine what would have been um, if, if something would have been different. Um, but probably the sense of emergency would have been um, more 
you know, present. However, I'm not sure this would have changed um, the immigration laws of all those countries. Um, I think that the fact that there was no sense of emergency was one factor uh, that no one really rushed to help the refugees and especially the Jewish refugees. But I don't think that um, if Evian had happened after the Kristallnacht, um, most countries present at the conference would have changed their immigration laws and immigration policies. Um, I think they mostly hid behind those immigration laws in many ways um, and used that as a pretext to basically close the doors um, to the Jewish refugees in, in many, many different ways. So I'm not sure that it would have changed a lot. But again, um, you know, this is about history. Yeah, counterfactuals can be, um, can be difficult, as you're saying. And uh, you said that the Avian Conference is not commemorated in France. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, sure. Well, somehow um, Avian is a kind of a non-event. Uh, it's it's a failure. Uh, it's, it's failure made it a non-event. In retrospect, the, the conference played a key role in the history of the Jewish refugees, but it is really difficult to commemorate a failure. Um, in the U.S., it's often used to highlight the fact that the U.S. government could or should have done more. But back in 1938, no other government tried to initiate any worldwide solution to help the Jews from the Reich. So um, what we could and should do when teaching about Avion is to draw lessons from history. But, um, you know, what would be the most important thing to me is to insist on the general context in which the conference was organized in order to understand why it became more than a failure. Um, the point is not about commemorating, but it, it is really about re replacing that it, um, what happened in a broader historical context. So that would explain the reasons behind the failure. And memory is very important, but knowing and teaching the facts are equally, if not more important. So um, in collective memory, Evian tends to be remembered in the United States as a failure uh, that is mostly used as an example. And um, that should not be basically an example that should not be replicated. And for um, just to give you an example, uh, of this during the um, discussion about the construction of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, it was decided to create what became the Committee on Conscience that would inform about um, contemporary genocide. And Elie Wiesel was among the experts who recommended that the future committee could help uh, alert the world about atrocities and maybe prevent another avion. So, you know, it's... Um, the, the fact that he referred to this, uh, to the Avian Conference, um, is to me a way to draw lessons from history. So this, really teaching history, teaching the facts um, is much more important than just commemoration. And in France, it's, it's absolutely not commemorated at all. It's barely known. Um, and uh, in France, um, you know, played a role in just, just uh, somehow being the place where the Evian Conference was organized just because Switzerland refused to organize it. So um, it's it's really hard to commemorate something that was considered as a failure. And someone asks, uh, why in your view has the uh, Avian Conference not factored more prominently in uh, debates about refugee settle uh, resettlement after the war? Like, was that, like, did... Were people talking about the Avian Conference in, say, 1946, 1947, 48, or? Mm, not really, but what is important is that the Avian Conference was really um, part of several discussions during the 1930s. So I would see the Avian Conference as a, a step into the um, creation of the status of refugees. I mean, that's really the, the discussion started really in the early 1930s. Um, and then, of course, nothing happened during the war. There was no discussion. Uh, and what the what we could consider refugees after the war would be the displaced persons. Uh, it was another kind of refugees, but it was, again, a kind of refugee crisis. Um, so if you think about 
the long-term history of refugees or humani what we would call today humanitarian diplomacy and human humanitarian response, um, Evian has a role, uh, but it was rarely referred to after the war um, because, again, it was only part of the bigger discussion and broader discussion that had started in the, in the early 30s. Um, especially um, in the League of, League of Nations. And so Evian was only one step among those big discussions and those recurrent discussions um, to create a legal status of refugees so that the countries would be uh, would have to do something during a refugee crisis. And the refugees would have a legal status. So Evian was not always referred to, but Evian was basically part of that long-term discussion that uh, resumed after the war and especially uh, much more in the early 1950s uh, and that ended up also in 1967 um, uh, when 147 countries uh, signed a convention that really framed the international response to humanitarian crisis around the world. And someone asks, uh, would you say that a major cause of the failure of the conference is that Jewish diplomats could not agree on a unified solution or a unified position to? If they had, a, it's again, it's it's hard to say. But if they had agreed uh, on something, it would have been probably uh, Palestine because that was the the most recurrent topic and and solution that came up at the conference. However. Um, the British didn't want anything. Um, I mean, they didn't want that solution to happen anyway. Um, and the, the British, I don't have time to explain more, but um, the British also um, tried to sabotage the conference um, from within. So um, even if the, the Jewish organizations uh, and the Jewish representatives of those organizations had agreed on proposing one single solution, a single solution that would have been Palestine, um, I don't think the British would have um, agreed um, to it. And the other plans were really, really too complicated to organize or too abstract or totally impractical. Um, so that, um, I mean, you know, Alaska, for example, um, was one of the most, the, one of the strangest one. Um, but some some plans were really impractical. He mentions that um, the advertisements which showed uh, from a funeral home seemed to imply that countries would not accept refugees without money. Was that the main problem in their acceptance? Was, um, I guess, how financially solvent the... This is a good question uh, because... Might have been. Um, again, it's, it's, um, I'm really, as a historian, I'm dealing with facts, um, and not, not with, you know, conditional things, but, um, I, I don't think it was really the major issue, uh, because, uh, again, some immigration laws were really restricted to certain nationalities, certain ethnicity. Um, I mean, if you think about the United States, yes, the U.S., um, you know, in order to come to the U.S., you could not be a public charge. Um, but um, this was not necessarily the case in most countries. I mean, that was not the condition to restrict the immigration. So um, it could have been the case for some countries, but for some others, it was clearly not the case. Um and the Jews who um, found their way to different countries um, did not become public charges anyway. Uh, they accepted most of, um, I mean, any any job that they could find. They were also supported by the local Jewish organizations. So um, I don't think that money was really the issue um, in, in that case. And um, where do you think the Avion Conference fits in to the history? To the history of refugees and refugeeism. Well, again, Evian um, somehow has its place within a broader uh, picture uh, and with within the history of refugees. Um, I think that somehow it it was um, a step forward because the intergovernmental governmental committee was created, uh, so that was something. But um, did it play a key role? In the um, 
in every everything related to um, the refugees, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it was an attempt. It was really an attempt to respond to a humanitarian crisis. Um, now, the legal status of refugee was not exactly discussed at the Evian conference and the legal status, but um, it shows that the whole world was not prepared to answer this kind of crisis at the time. Um, but again, the, the whole history of the Evian conference cannot be um, studied completely in, in isolation. It really has to be placed in that broader history of humanitarian diplomacy and humanitarian um, crisis of refugees. So it's, um, it, it is really mirroring the, uh, the two precedent um, uh, conferences that were organized in, um, you know, prior to Avian conference, uh, the Avian conference, but it's also somehow a place where all the countries had a chance to do something and didn't seize it. And a question, and someone asked a uh, kind of a question about definitions that um, uh, they say they say I'm wondering what the difference is between the following terms: migration, forced migration and deportation. Um, is that something? Um, well, uh, we could spend the whole evening uh, on definitions. Um, well, migration, I mean, being a migrant, um, you can migrate to anywhere. I mean, you can just, it means that you move from one country to another one. So there is no, you don't necessarily need assistance. You don't need a legal status of anything in terms of help uh, from that you would receive from another country. So migration means just to move from one country to another one. Forced migration is different because you have to leave your own country to go somewhere and to find another country to accept you. Um, so that's that's different. Uh, you did not choose to migrate. You didn't choose to move out of your own country. You were forced to leave your own country. Um, and deportation... Um, it is very it, it is a um a difficult um term for me to define because in english you use that to um send people back to their own country uh so you have to distinguish this kind of move moving one person back to their to their own country um it, it is important to dis to distinguish this action from the deportation of the Jews. Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure what the person means by deportation in that context. And a few people have asked, uh, have mentioned the kinder transport. Um, how might, um, how and why might the British have responded uh, the way they did during the Avian conference uh, compared to the kinder transport? Um, do you have any thoughts on that or? Well, the, the allowed the, the you know the children the, the Jewish children um, on the condition that they were not accompanied. Uh, they allowed some of them to um, go to the UK. Um, but um, the the British didn't want to open the, the gates of Palestine. Uh, they really certainly didn't want to allow a, a bigger, a larger Jewish immigration there. Um, and it's um, you know you have to bear in mind that there was the uh, that um, the white paper in 1939 uh, from that was actually published um, by the British and it, it it really did not it did not allow Jewish immigration in Palestine. Um, so on one end they agreed to take um, some Jewish non uh, non accompanied children uh, in the UK, but they certainly feared a, a large um, immigration, a large-scale immigration of Jews in Palestine, and they were completely against it. Oh, well, very good. Well, thank you for that. And I think that was the final question that we had. So, um... I've just been reflecting um, on your conversation and the significance of your presentation. I think so often in the field of Holocaust memorialization, we're focusing on the atrocities, but we don't spend as much time talking about um, not only the, the social processes and, and politics leading up to this kind of violence, but 
just how, um, you know, you know, it just how almost, I don't want to say insignificant, but I'm thinking of the, this thing that we had the conversation of um, a few weeks ago when you said, you know, all of these politicians were going to Avion and they're going to a spa town and they're having this meeting. And there's almost a, you know, a cognitive dissonance happening where we're talking now in retrospect, we understand people's lives were at stake, but at that, in those moments, there's, is it's, it's not the banality of evil, but it's, uh, these moments are just passing and there's not necessarily this imperative. Um, and I think that as we look at what's happening in our world now, I think it's, it's important for us to reflect on this. Something else that you said the last time that we spoke was that, you know, what happened then and what happened now is not necessarily the same thing. But I think it's important to, as we look at immigration that's taking and, and the, the conversation around it now, it's what are, what's driving people to come and what's driving people to leave. I know there are many people on the call whose families are survivors, certainly in my family. Um, we've also fled, and I really appreciate you also talking about definitions and the significance of leaving voluntarily or not. So thank you so much, Dr. Afamato. Thank you, Professor Muchowski. And thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We hope you stay safe and well. Thank you.